So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our annual business rate payers consultation. I'm Catherine McGuinness, I'm the city's policy chair, and I'm very uh, grateful to you all for giving up your time to join us at our first virtual uh, meeting. These meetings are a valuable opportunity for us to hear some of your views. So just a little bit of housekeeping from me before um, I tell you what to expect and uh, a couple of remarks from me. Uh, Today's session is being run as a webinar, so only the speakers will be on camera. If you'd like to ask a question, and we hope you will, please put your question in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And uh, please, if you have any technical issues, use the chat function and uh, colleagues will try to assist you. So any questions in Q&A, any uh, issues, tech issues in chat, and please be aware that this session is being recorded. So just to give you an idea of how the session will run, um, after, after me, there will be an update from my colleague, Jeremy Mayhew, the chairman of the Finance Committee, who will discuss the city's financial situation. Then Ian Dyson, the commissioner of the City of London Police, will give an update on crime and policing in the city. John Baradell, our town clerk and chief executive, will give an update on other key issues facing the city. And then finally, we'll have the opportunity to answer some of your questions. And before I hand to Jeremy, I'd just like to say a few words on COVID, on recovery, on competitiveness, and uh, then on uh, elections. And on uh, COVID, uh, clearly we're facing an unprecedented time, and this year began as most of us really hoped it wouldn't, in the midst of another national lockdown. Over the past year, businesses in the city have shown extraordinary resilience and adaptability, but many of course face significant uh, challenges. Our focus throughout this time has been on supporting those businesses uh, to the extent that we can. So we have been providing information and guidance such as business webinars and advice on accessing finance. We've facilitated access to financial support, be that administering government grants or making uh, rental payments more manageable for our tenants. And it has to be said that when it comes to government grants, uh, we have had a very low allocation. So uh, it has been difficult for us to give as much support as, as we would have liked, something which we are in regular dialogue, uh, even now with government uh, to try to change. We also continue to provide a voice for businesses in the city calling on government to provide appropriate support to those hit hardest. We know that businesses have put a huge amount of work uh, into ensuring that their businesses are COVID secure. We too, in fact, have put uh, measures in place so that when we're able to do so, we can welcome people back to the city safely. And that includes changes to our public realm to support uh, social distancing and a pilot COVID accreditation scheme aimed at reassuring uh, customers. We know that the coming weeks and months will continue to be tough. We know that we must all continue to work together to help uh, bring down the rate of infection. And that means staying at home uh, to save lives and protect the NHS. Because the sooner we get this virus under control, the sooner we can get the city back to some normality. And of course, we're thinking uh, hard uh, about what we should do uh, to uh, not only get it back to normality, but make sure that we all thrive uh, once we can reopen. And we've set up our own recovery task force to ensure that the square mile uh, remains a world leader. It will be focusing on four key dimensions, our world-class business ecosystem, our outstanding sustainable environments, our vibrant cultural offer, and how we can continue to attract the best people with the right skills and talent. How we can ensure that you and your business, your, you and your staff are very keen to be back in the city and find it uh, a, a, an excellent place to do business. As part of that work, uh, we have a survey and we would really welcome your thoughts uh, on that survey. And I am hoping that a link to it will be posted in chat uh, for you to see. The work of our recovery uh, task, uh, Force, alongside our new climate action strategy will help us to build on the positive trends of recent months and to make the most of opportunities to build back better so that we uh, remain an attractive destination uh, for businesses. At the same time as looking at what we're doing for the square mile itself, we are very focused too on, um, uh, on our competitiveness, our competitiveness at home, but also abroad, uh, with our Lord Mayor engaging in virtual travels rather than his usual physical travels, and uh, uh, generally with our work 
on uh, um, promoting uh, the uh, UK's uh, financial professional services uh, uh, to uh, to um, uh, to the world. Of course, we face a new relationship with our neighbours, uh, the EU, um, following the end of the transition period. And uh, we're doing what we can to help build a new positive uh, relationship on that front too, as well as uh, engaging with other uh, partners overseas. Now, finally, before I hand over to Jeremy to talk about our finances, I do just want to mention our elections. Next year will be a, an election year for the city. We have, as you will know, a business uh, vote. We are very keen that you should register uh, for that vote uh, for the maximum number of uh, votes that you can and then indeed exercise your votes. Um, and uh, indeed consider whether any of you or your uh, 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 colleagues uh, might consider standing in those elections. So please bear that in mind. Uh, there's information on our website if you want to know more or do get in touch with me. I'm always happy to point you uh, in the right direction. So. I will now hand over to Jeremy. Last year, we spoke to you about the financial pressures that the City Corporation, like many other public bodies, uh, is facing. And over the past year, we've undertaken a review of our activities and governance arrangements. And we've already begun to implement some significant changes to help us achieve our corporate objectives in a way which is uh, effective, efficient and sustainable. And with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to the Chairman of Finance, Jeremy Mayhew, to speak to you about the financial situation. Jeremy. Thank you, Catherine. I hope that my video and microphone are on. I assume somebody will tell me if not. Can I start by echoing the policy chair's warm welcome? I'm pleased that so many of you have been able to join us virtually to hear our plans for the square mile. Uh, this is in some ways a poignant moment for me, for two reasons. It's the last time I speak to you as chairman of finance. I will be handing over the baton to my successor, yet to be formally elected in May because we have term limits and I will have done five years in May. Uh, and since I spoke to you last year, external events have been challenging to say the least i think there's that's one of those sort of official euphemisms with covid's impact on health on well-being and on our finances looking at our own finances the impact of covid-19 stands at just over an adverse effect of 15 million in the current financial year on our local authority fund with income losses from the closure of many services and activities, including in particular the Barbican Centre, and significant losses from income from our property investment portfolio. We have reined back spend in the year and expect to recover about £11 million from the government's compensation scheme. But the remaining 4 million deficit will need to come from reserves, which inevitably means scaling back the plan provision for funding for major projects. We haven't been able to suspend the laws of arithmetic. The COVID pressures and risks will continue for all of us into 21, 22 fiscal year, and I'm sure beyond. For the City Corporation, we face income losses from closures of many services and activities, as I've already mentioned. Additionally, across the medium term, the external environment is highly uncertain. I need hardly tell you that. With potentially significant changes in funding for both local government and the police, the Chamberlain's paper, which I hope you've all received, outlines our reduced income projections in two areas. First, retained income from business rates, and second, direct funding from government. For 21-22, we are responding to the financial challenge in two ways. A general budget reduction of 12% in 21-22, and we're making organizational efficiencies through what we call a new target operating model, 
in the jargon, the TOM, which will make an increasing contribution over the medium term. We have, however, protected the most vulnerable services, or perhaps I should say the services for the vulnerable, prioritizing areas such as children's services, rough sleeping, and support to our academy students, making, for example, only 6% reductions in the social care budget, to which I will return later. Over the next year, we will fo focus on making the organizational efficiencies I've already mentioned, as well as improving how we prioritize our resources. Um, to ensure, one, that we are spending on the key priorities, and two, that our plans, plans are sustainable in the medium term. Sustainability is indeed a vital watchword. A word of caution. Oh, this is probably for my colleagues as much as for you. This is only the start of the essential task of getting our finances back in order over the next few years. More, I fear, will need to be done. That said, when I hand over responsibility for our finances to, our, to my successor, I look forward to having in place agreed plans and measures to enable us to have improving and robust finances, critically ensuring for the medium term that our financial position is sustainable. Thank goodness I won't have to follow in the footsteps of Liam Byrne, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury at the end of the last Labour government, who famously wrote a note to his successor, simply saying, I'm afraid there is no more money left. Um, as a direct result of the hard labour by both officers, in particular in the Chamberlain's department, and my colleagues, especially those on Finance Committee and on the Resource Allocation Subcommittee, I will have to simply follow a, a less famous remark of Liam Byrne in the same note in which he wished his successor good luck. And I have every intention of doing the same. For you, as ratepayers and taxpayers, what does this mean? We recognize that businesses in the square mile have been hit hard by COVID. We only have to look at the unusually empty streets to know how hard the retail and hospitality sectors have been hit. Given the gloomy outlook for many businesses in the city, we plan to do what we can to assist city ratepayers. Increase in the uniform business rate are outside our control, as they're determined by the application of inflation indices by central government. The business rate premium in the city is within our control. And we are currently minded not to increase the premium in 21 and 22, retaining the premium at 0.8p in the pound, which is what we set last year. I would also like to highlight the, the support we have provided on behalf of central government to businesses. I hope you now have a slide up. We have paid out £130 million pound in rate relief in 2021, in this financial year, to 2,300 businesses in retail and le leisure sector sectors uh, who are paying uh, no rates. Actually, we, we've distributed to wider than that, but the biggest focus has been those sectors. And we're supporting SMEs. We have administered over £20 million in government grants. And we also continue to administer what are called national restriction grants. In the last 10 days, 425 businesses have received payments for the Tier 3 schemes. And Tier 4 schemes are now being paid automatically without the need for further application form. I hope that's a good example of cut, cutting bureaucracy. Unfortunately, the city, as uh, the policy chair has already mentioned, has only received a small amount of discretionary funding, actually only 281,000. 
and this is insufficient to allow the city to administer a separate scheme. So we have rolled the funding into the tier two open scheme and extended the support to include some retail and medical businesses. As Catherine has already mentioned, we have been lobbying government to increase support for our businesses. Turning to local government services to resident, residents, and I feel st strongly about this as somebody who represents one of the four residential wards. I mentioned earlier that we felt the need to protect social care spending from the full impact of a 12% reduction. The government has permitted, as in previous years, an adult social precept of up to 3%, which we will probably levy. Leaving a 3% social, social, levying a 3% so, social care precept would raise about 200,000 pounds. This broadly equates to the 6% of the budget for adult social care and old people services. That is the amount of savings that we would avoid by raising the precept. So to explain further, if you are banned D cancel taxpayer, which is the normal middle band that we use for benchmarking purposes, the 3% levy equates to £43.30 annually, or £3.61 per month on your tax bill. So at this month's finance committee, I will be recommending this 3% social care levy, but I will also be recommending that, that we do not this year increase the core council tax. As you have heard from the policy chair, the city has ambitious plans to build back better. And we are continuing to develop our plans, namely to move the Museum of London to a new site in Smithfield, which should help regenerate the northwest corner of the city, and to build a new headquarters for our police force in the combined courts building. Very necessary given the poor state of repair of some of our current buildings. The new policing combined court should st help strengthen our hand in the fight against economic crime, about which I expect you will hear more from the commissioner, and reinforce London's position as a world leading centre for legal services. These plans have significant be benefits for businesses, for residents and for workers in the city, but they come with significant price tags. The Finance Committee uh, and the Policy and Resources Committee have together worked to strengthen the way we reprioritize existing budgets. And they have been much more vigorous, I would say, than previously in deciding which building and infrastructure schemes we undertake. You'll see from the Chamberlain's report that across the medium term, budget deficits before mitigation are forecast to peak at 12.6 million in 2022-23 next year. And although reducing to 8 million by the end of the period still pose a potential threat to the financial stability of city fund that is to say the local government budget. There is still some way to go in bridging the gap. And in future years, I fear tax increases may need to be considered. I do not take tax increases lightly. My own electors and my committee know that I am instinctively a low tax politician. However, I believe the use of the social care precept is completely justified to protect our, local, our social care services from the cuts we might otherwise need to make. Our council taxpayers will still benefit from one of the lowest council taxes in the country, and those on the lowest incomes are eligible for council tax relief. I can assure you that we will not let up in our drive to deliver efficient and cost-effective services. Having heard 
the extent of the challenges facing us. And in the light of today's meeting, I hope you will support the following taxation proposals for the coming financial year. And at our social care precept of 3%, a freeze in our council tax and retaining the city's business rate premium at 0.8p in the pound. And now I turn over to the commissioner. Uh, Ian, can you come in, please? So I've got the Commissioner of the City of London Police, Ian Dyson, I hope. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Jeremy. I hope uh, everyone can uh, see and hear me. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to uh, come into this uh, seminar or this uh, meeting. I want to cover three things in my session uh, briefly. One is about uh, an overview of policing the city during COVID uh, situation. Secondly, just to talk about some of the priorities that we have and what, uh, what we're performing, how we're performing against them. And thirdly, just a little bit about the future. Um, so policing the city during COVID, um, it has been a challenge uh, as you would expect. I am one of those organisations that does still need to make sure that a significant number of my officers uh, still come into work. Uh, and we have done that throughout the period. Sadly, we did lose an officer early on in the crisis, which was um, a bit of a, a blow to us. Um, he was a long serving city officer, but thankfully um, that has been the only uh, person that has died from the, the, the police force during this period. We've had peaks and troughs of uh, sickness, as you would expect, policing can be at times a, a sort of a contact uh, profession. We do need to engage with the public. We do need to work sometimes as a team. And that has had an impact. And we've worked really hard to manage our business at the same time as observing and respecting social distancing and protection for our officers and the public. Um, yes, the numbers are lower in terms of footfall through the city. But we are still a community that requires policing services, whether it be the staff that do come into work in the city, it's the residents, it's the security staff, it's Bath's hospital, etc. So we're still out there um, protecting the public and also ensuring where possible that uh, compliance with the regulations is made. I'd also uh, point out, and it is important, that the CT threat to the city remains the same now as it was before lockdown and during lockdown. Uh, you only have to see that last year a woman was imprisoned, convicted in prison for plotting to plant a bomb in St Paul's Cathedral. We do remain a target rich environment for uh, the terrorist and that is a real focus of our efforts and activities over this Covid period. There is always the uh, challenge of protest. Thankfully we haven't seen any uh, major protests in the city. Uh, they have been mainly in Westminster and we've been supporting our Met colleagues in that but nonetheless we must be prepared for and anticipate that we may get protests particularly as the restrictions continue the vaccines are rolled out and we start to see publicly that um, maybe the infection rates are dropping there will be this impatience I think to return to normality. We are um, absolutely working along the guidelines that National Police Chiefs Council has laid down around how we enforce lockdown despite the many changes that we've seen over the period to the regulations and restrictions. And those are effectively four E's. We engage, we explain, we educate, and we only enforce if all of those three other options are not complied with. And what that means is that, uh, just to give you an example of that, during this whole period since March of last year, we have used our powers 190 times in the city. Um, that's effectively a direction to cease doing something or a direction to return home. It's not a fine, it's, it's the, the, the stage before enforcement. 190 times in the, in the city to people and we've issued 76 fines. That is where people have refused to comply with the directions given by the police officer. Now those uh, use of powers is scrutinised uh, regularly by the Police Authority Board to 
to make sure that we are appropriate in our use of the powers, we are proportionate, et cetera, et cetera. So that remains a, a significant piece of business for us. The other um, responsibility we have, which I think many of you are aware, is that we are the national police force lead for uh, economic crime and fraud. Fraud is now the single biggest crime type in the United Kingdom, according to the British Crime Survey. And we are responsible for national recording and reporting of fraud. And we have the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau. Those bits of our business have been as busy during lockdown as they ever were. In fact, in the early stages of lockdown, we saw an increase in the amount of reporting of fraud. Um, and that trend has continued. We saw a blip and it dropped during the sort of summer and into the autumn. But to, to give you again a flavor of that, April 2019, so sort of a, an average month before COVID hit, we were seeing between 28 and 30,000 reports of fraud into our national uh, reporting service uh, per month. Now, January, we saw 35,000. So the trend is upwards and that is continuing. So we have a big responsibility on behalf of national policing around that. What we saw is fraudsters are using COVID as an excuse for um, committing fraud. So for example, they will be selling uh, online things like gels, personal protective equipment, all fraudulent, probably don't exist. Um, and we saw them using that as their sort of methodology rather than other types of, of products online. But what we're seeing now is also um, fraud related to the vaccine. Uh, we've had 26 reports of, of specific fraud to date, which doesn't sound very much, but that doesn't take into account what is the main uh, sort of methodology for the criminal now for uh, around vaccine fraud, which is all the email spams that are being sent. And I would encourage everyone to be really cautious if you get an email offering a vaccine or anything to do with the vaccine program. The NHS has a very robust um, program of rolling it out and be wary of unsolicited emails um, that offer you something different, particularly if there's some expectation of payment. And we did arrest recently and charge somebody who was allegedly um, taking money from a 92 year old for administering a, a vaccine of some description. So we are very much proactive working with other partners to make sure that uh, criminals don't profit from this particular crime type. Let me just move quickly to uh, some of our priorities. I won't go through all of them in detail because of time, but just to say un unsurprisingly, we have seen within the Square Mile a, a sort of headline reduction in overall crime of about 48%. That's the financial year to date, so from sort of April to April. That's not surprising given that the numbers of people in the city are significantly lower. And a, a large number of our um, particularly violent crime was linked to our nighttime economy in the city and the bars and restaurants um, being closed. We've seen about a 60% decrease in violence uh, involving injury. We've seen a 50% reduction in commercial burglaries. And at the start of the first lockdown last year, we did actually see a slight increase in commercial burglaries in, in that uh, I think uh, commercial burglars saw the opportunity of an empty city to come in and start to try and get into offices. Um, what they haven't accounted for, of course, is that because there were so few people in the city, they stood out to my officers uh, a little bit more obviously. And we've managed to get quite a few arrests in those first few months. We obviously expect those numbers to start to increase again as and when the city starts to come back to life. And just to reassure everyone, we are out there working with the security guards in the big companies and we are working uh, on our own to protect your properties and businesses while they may be empty or few staff in. Road safety has also seen a, a, another significant reduction, uh, around about sort of a 60% reduction in the number of personal injury accidents um, in the July to December period of this last year, calendar year that's just gone. Um, still saw 64 personal injury accidents. We do get quite a bit of traffic passing through the city. Um, there is no uh, real evidence that the lack of traffic has led to a, an increase in speed. Yes, you do see some people being a bit silly, um, but overall people are complying with the speed limits uh, broadly 
um, compared to normal. Um, I say that will increase as the city returns to work. Um, what we're seeing still in the city is uh, crimes of shoplifting, um, theft of phones, things like that, of those people who are in the city, and bicycle theft still haven't really changed a, a great deal. Slight drop since lockdown, but people are using bicycles, those are coming into the city, and we are very uh, alert to that. We arrested uh, a team from East London and recovered about 60 or 70 stolen bicycles in one hit a few months ago. So that's, that's really encouraging. What of the future? Security, in my view, is key to all the ambition of keeping the city as a, as a vibrant place. If you don't have a safe place to do business, then I think that's a challenge. So we are working with the corporation to make sure that we are, um, we are able to protect businesses that are working and coming returning to work in the city. We've benefited from the uplift program that the Home Office have been uh, funding, which is to have 20,000 uh, new police officers over the, next, over the three year period, starting from last year. And we benefit from that locally. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, say that we, we're seeing some really good candidates coming through into the City of London Police. And we benefited from um, local uplift as well last year that enabled me to put more resource into our counter-terrorism work in the square mile and our firearms capability. We still have some uh, uncertainty about some discrete funding streams. We're hoping we'll get that certainty in the next week or so or month or so. That's around things like Transport for London funding for road safety and some of the funding streams from government around uh, terrorism. So uh, until we get that certainty, we just have to, to be prepared for a little bit of flex around some of our business plans. But overall, we are on track to deliver our savings for this year. And we are also uh, well into our plan for our savings plan to deliver savings next financial year as well. Around uh, the national responsibilities um, since last year, uh, I have also become the National Police Chiefs Council, I'm the national lead on cyber crime as well as economic crime and fraud, which is a great opportunity for the city uh, to be leading in this space. Um, it makes sense given that so much, something about 80% of fraud is now cyber enabled or has some involvement in cyber. And that's enabled the Home Office to fund us to the tune of an additional uh, number of officers, about 30, not specifically for the square mile, but to work across national policing on preventing fraud, which will benefit um, both businesses and, and the public. Um, we have a transformational change program. I think Town Clark will be talking about some of the changes in the corporation. We've been running a transform program for a number of years to do two things really. One is to enable us to meet our savings challenge, but also more importantly, to make sure that we are uh, aligning our business and our operational business to meet the needs of the communities and our other stakeholders. So we went live with one of the early iterations of that uh, at the end of last year, which is a local policing model named chief inspectors responsible for a geographic area of the square mile. It's to provide that very clear link between yourselves and us. Um, I think at times recently there's been uh, sort of a lack of certainty of who do you need to contact if you have a particular issue. That certainty is now uh, agreed and they are building their teams and their capability at the moment and that will, will benefit both business and residents. And finally, we have also just launched our equality and inclusion strategy. 2020 was a, a tough year for policing around the Black Lives Matter challenge, uh, and where we need to make sure that we are providing a service that is appropriate and proportionate to our communities, but also that we are properly supporting our own staff. And we've developed a strategy with a lot of work that has gone behind that, to make sure over the next two, three years, we move to, to be far more uh, capable and achieving around that agenda uh, than we have been in the past. That's a very uh, quick run through a lot of our work over the last year. Um, I'll hand back now to uh, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. And, and now I'm going to hand on to our time clerk and chief exec, uh, John Baradell. John. I'm afraid you're mute, John. <laughs> It had to be one of us, didn't it? 
Um, first of all, thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, I'm John Baradell, the Chief Executive or Town Clerk of the Corporation. And last year, you may recall that I said 2020 was set to be an important year. Well, I wasn't wrong, although in ways probably I didn't foresee at the time. Even within the context of the 900 years of history as a corporation and the city for far longer, this has been an extremely unusual and challenging year for us all. And given the corporation's different roles, a local authority for the square mile, a provider of public services across London and beyond, ambassadors for financial and professional services, we've had to deal with COVID in all its forms and all its effects. The health impact, the social impact, and the economic impact, as indeed some of your questions have been pointing out. In many ways, we know the greatest challenge lies ahead as we as an organization and a place have to focus on our shared recovery and ensure that London emerges from this period better than before, the build back better as it's commonly called. Now vital to ensuring that the corporation is operating efficiently functioning effectively and remains fit for purpose in the medium to long term, we've commenced, as the Chair of Finance has said, implementation of the corporation's target operating model. This is essentially a restructuring of the organisation to deliver financial savings, to achieve a balanced medium term financial plan, and to deliver a range of benefits to make sure we're equipped for the immediate and the long term external challenges we know we face ahead. So what does it mean? We'll seize opportunities, we'll build our internal capabilities, we'll transform and strengthen our enabling services, and we'll realise our benefits and collective value. And through this programme, we'll deliver a set of ambitious projects designed to benefit not only the square mile, but London and the UK beyond. John, can I just interrupt you a second? Some people are having trouble hearing. I'm not, but if you could perhaps speak a little louder or something, there appear to be a couple of participants unable to hear. I will I will try Catherine uh, hopefully that's a little bit better I'm not known for my quiet voice having uh, having muted maybe that was the problem. So the few, let's look towards the future of the city then the city's always shown remarkable resilience and ability to adapt to the extraordinary challenges and circumstances it's faced. However the challenges that we now face are both short and longer term the short term challenges relate to the continued absence of a number of workers within the city. Most firms continuing to encourage remote working, leaving shops, hospitality and cultural venues empty. The longer term challenge is even more significant. If substantial numbers of workers move to a more flexible model of working, splitting time between home and office, what does that mean for the city as a place for business? As Catherine mentioned earlier, this is why the recovery task force has been set up and plans for reopening are so critical and will work to deliver the priorities and recommendations from our London Recharge Report to ensure that the Square Mile is the world's most innovative, inclusive and sustainable business ecosystem, an attractive place in which to invest, to work, live and to visit. But let's be clear, businesses still want to be in the Square Mile, albeit the Square Mile may look and feel different. And we don't underestimate the challenges but our fundamental strength remains openness and global outlook, enterprise and an excellent business environment with a skilled and entrepreneurial workforce. Now, the last year has been a balance of hardships and achievements as we've adapted to new ways of working. That includes the launch of our climate action strategy. And I'm very proud that we've also entered the top 50 firms for the first time in the Social Mobility Employer Index. That's giving opportunities for those that don't necessarily have those opportunities to work in firms, in institutions like the city and to promote their achievements and their success. This includes us delivering against our corporate aims and includes contributing to a flourishing society. That's ensuring the city is welcoming to all workers, residents and visitors alike through virtual offerings. So the city continues to be a place where commerce and creativity have thrived side by side, keeping our streets safe, as you've heard from the commissioner, providing social care, supporting our residents and businesses and maintaining access to open spaces. And to address chronic issues, not only in the city, but London and the UK and beyond. 
particularly in the context of exacerbated inequalities from the pandemic. Issues like rough sleeping, working with our outreach partners, Thames Reach, and establishing an assessment centre to ensure a rapid response and rapid route away from the streets. And in addition, as you've heard, to the reinvention of existing services, we've launched new ones, such as the City Wellbeing Centre, an innovative project providing therapeutic support to those living and working in the city who are suffering from mental ill health. With a wide range of programmes of work that seek to promote the city as the world leading business and a renewed focus on competitiveness, collaboration and innovation. All of this underpinned by an extensive programme of engagement, working with key international markets to attract investors and investment to London, including, I have to be said, virtual visits to the United States, to the Gulf, India and China. It's certainly a way of reducing jet lag. We'll, develop, we'll continue to develop and bring new talent to London's workforce, ensuring access to opportunity, skills and employment. And finally, through shaping outstanding environments, we have an opportunity now to look at how we do things, and in a phrase we've heard time and time again, build back better. This has never actually been more important, and climate action is, of course, a critically important part of that. We'll be dedicating more street space to walking and cycling, with rider pavements, new parks, and the in installation of flood-resistant road surfaces, and seeking to help businesses, workers, and visitors, and giving confidence to continue to work in or return to the city, while the need for social distancing remains. And finally, if I can thank you for your time, and I and the team of officers also on the call look forward to questions that you've been putting in the Q&A box and please I'd encourage as many of you to do so as you can and we'd like and look forward to working through those and now back to you Catherine. Thank you very much <clears throat> thank you very much John. So uh, now over to questions and incidentally if anybody didn't hear John we will be posting the recording as soon as we can hopefully you can pick anything up from there. Um, we, on the questions, we've had a, a number of questions, first of all, on the uh, rate position that Jeremy outlined. Um, Caroline, do you want to come in on those questions? When the change will be affected and uh, what it means in terms of bill? Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. So with the business rates itself, uh, the proposal is that we free the premium element of it, um, and that's subject to Finance Committee and then court approval. On the actual uh, part of it that Jeremy referred to, where the government decides, um, they've said they'll maintain. So all things being equal, the business rate should, should stay the same. Um, one caveat on that, which is about the government support for uh, the retail and hospitality sector. So there was full rates relief this year for that sector. Um, we are not sure yet whether that will continue to 21-22. So, so the government has given no assurance at, at the moment of that, um, but we await further guidance on it. Uh, so the approval will come through on, on the 4th of March as to the decision that's made on that. Um, there was also a query from um, Brian Coxon, um, a, a small business, not in the leisure and, and retail sector saying what, what sort of support is available in that situation. Well, the central government support is, is only for the rates bill in the retail and leisure sector. As Jeremy mentioned, there is a small amount for the discretionary scheme. So um, I'd encourage you to, to, to get in touch on that one. We will be sending out applications shortly. It does cover um, SME medical businesses. So that, that looks promising if the rateable value is less than 150K. Um, but on that note, I'm going to invite Phil Black to, to come in um, on the discretionary scheme. Uh, just there's, there may be others interested on, on the call. So Phil, if you could come in, that would be helpful. Thank you. Just to uh, reinforce uh, Caroline's statement there. Yes, we are, um, the discretionary scheme, we are sending out applications the um, next couple of days, if not today, um, to um, about 800 businesses that fall into um, what we would call SME, and they do include medical, uh, physiotherapy and those sorts of businesses, um, also news agents and um, other businesses that haven't had any support through the grants because they haven't been mandated to close at this stage. Um, so that the scheme that we're operating hopefully is a little bit more generous than the government Tier 2 scheme. Um, that this is sort of um, replicated. 
Um, and there is also, do you want me to take the section 44A question? Please do, Phil, yes. Um, the section 44A um, hasn't altered at all. And um, so if a building is partially empty, um, the same policy that we would apply would apply to that. So we'll take each case on its own merits. But generally, we would um, consider a section 44A where the, uh, the, the, the people are continuing in the property. We would just expect that area to be completely clear of everything. And it would be empty. So it would, um, if they were uh, undertaking some refurbishment, then that would probably meet the criteria. Thank you very much, Phil. And actually, in response to uh, Mr. Cotson's questions, I think I would also say um, it's a very challenging time, we realise, for everybody. And, uh, uh, you know, we would love to have more money to support you all. Unfortunately, uh, there are limits to the schemes that we're administering. Um, but please do see if the latest um, uh, iteration is helpful. And please do uh, you know, keep, keep in touch with us. Um, I, I see a question, actually, on communications on business rates and requests to pay by uh, email will it be available online can you answer that one phil sorry catherine what was the question there's a question with offices being empty it's painful to receive communications on business rates and requests to pay by regular mail will it be available online um, unfortunately unfortunately we can't e-bill at this point but what we can do is you can register for an online account and if you um, email us and request that we can send you out a pin so people can then check their own account online but our notices do continue to go out by mail unfortunately we are working on uh, an e-bill solution and we do hope to have that very early in, in, in the next financial year, um, but annual bills will be going by post as you. Thank you. And can I ask colleagues, uh, when we send out uh, a report after this meeting, can we include uh, information how to apply for the grants and what the criteria are? Because I see questions also coming through about uh, about that. Jeremy, okay. you'd like to come in. Yeah, very quickly, uh, just two points. Um, one is, I would actually, I'm going to start my video. Um, I would encourage people to lobby the government and our member of parliament. Uh, a deluge of representations from city business is perhaps copied to us would be very welcome. I mean, at the heart of the problem is the problem we quite often uh, face, which is that most of these things are based upon residential numbers and they're only about 10,000 residents, but they're over 350,000 people who come in, in on a normal, in normal times to the city to work. So the formula doesn't work for us. And we land up uh, with large numbers of businesses in the position that you have identified and we're hugely sympathetic and almost no money. Uh, so, I mean, if I might say so, I understand the frustration to people, but it's not in my view that we have misinterpreted uh, the criteria or n held back money which we could hand out. We have handed it out as quickly as possible. But the fact is we've received almost no money to speak of in the scheme of things. We'd love to have more. And I give you the assurance that if we get more, we'll get on with handing it out. But I make life a bit hellish for our member of parliament and ministers so that they recognize how unfairly we've been treated. And one other point, which I realize doesn't do people any good, that though we in normal times raise about 900 million pounds as business rates, almost all of that goes straight to central government. So it's not that we're getting the rates and refusing to relieve people. It's the central government's getting the rates and not relieving people. So a bit of agit prop, I think, here might be quite useful. It would be very helpful. And indeed, we've been uh, lobbying relentlessly, I would say, together with uh, uh, partners, not only our MP, uh, the Minister for London is aware of our problems. Uh, we've been speaking with the central London, uh, other central London boroughs. But your voice, uh, ratepayers, would be uh, additionally helpful. So please do uh, contact that, uh, the MP. Right. I'd like to move on to um, the question of startups. We've got a question um, uh, in, in the chat box around uh, what we might be doing to encourage smaller businesses and startups, uh, particularly in the uh, tech sector, um, to come into the city. I'm going to ask Damien Nussbaum, our Director of Innovation and Growth, to come in. Damien. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so this is a really key area for the dynamism uh, of the future of the city. 
the, as you'd expect, we follow pretty closely what the figures are. And the current picture is, is mixed. Last September, we saw a big spike in business dissolutions and liquidations, coinciding with the end of Seabell's support. But for the rest of the year, year on year, both before September and after that, the number of dissolutions has actually been far lower than the number in 2019, rather surprisingly. On the other side of the equation, new business registrations in the immediate uh, aftermath of the start of the crisis a year ago were down 40%. Since then, they recovered, um, and they haven't actually been far off 2019 levels for the rest of the year. Um, but we still see a real opportunity and need to support and increase the number of startups and scale-ups. And I think actually in this context, scale-ups is, is equally or perhaps even more important than the startups. You want to see that increase in, in size and heft. So what are we doing on that front? We work with investors wanting to come to the UK with London and partners in the Department of International Trade. We have a department within the uh, corporation the City Property Advisory Team, who are available, who are quite unique in the service they provide of, of uh, providing help in finding premises. We work in terms of finding talent and skills, and that's been one of the areas that has come back to us most strongly, the, the strength of talent and skills, the need of access. So we work with the Financial Services Skills Commission, also work on sustainability um, and social mobility that we've just launched with government. We um, have work around tech and fintech, so we're supporting with Innovate Finance the Khalifa Review, which we'll be reporting very soon on how we can increase tech and fintech. We're working on sustainable finance for um, sustainable uh, companies, and indeed how to support net zero. And um, finally, I would say if there are specific ideas about how we can take this work further, please do respond to the recovery task force. The link is in the chat box. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Damien. And yes, please do uh, respond to that and let us know what would help uh, What would help you. Um, uh, we've got uh, some quite specific questions about uh, traffic issues. We've got a question about e-scooters, which I think the commissioner uh, uh, will answer. I hope he will. Ian, can I get you back, please? Thank you, uh, Catherine. Yes, uh, so the subject of e-scooters is one that uh, is very much um, in a uh, subject of debate by government about the allowing them to be legal um, and rental is the way that they're going to start to sort of test whether um, that's a good idea or not. I think, you know, in the pandemic, uh, we are, the government is encouraging people not to use public transport, so e-scooters are a good way of doing that. Um, we have we have been out there uh, enforcing where we see that uh, people are using them, but again, I go back to we're doing the four E's so that we're not just sort of going straight in and seizing them. Um, we are working with the corporation around looking at options around a sort of um, rental um, scheme around uh, e-scooters uh, within the uh, around testing and licensing them for hire. So we are looking at a number of options in line with government. What I would say is, um, I talked about the road traffic accidents uh, statistics earlier. Um, we've seen uh, a reduction, but there were still 64 uh, personal injury accidents between July and December, of which just two involved e-scooters. So I would sort of want to assure the, uh, the questioner that we're not seeing them being sort of used uh, really irresponsibly. I'm sure there are certain individual circumstances, but it's something that we're very alive to. Thank you very much, Ian. And before you uh, disappear off uh, camera, uh, we've also had a question about action fraud. And I wonder if you could give us an update on that initiative. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. This is, I think, uh, when I saw the question, it was around the initiative with CC, the Chartered Institute of Security uh, and Investment. And yes. this is to, um, you know, we recognise that in order to deal with this growing challenge of fraud, we can't possibly deal with it with just our own resources. So we're looking at using uh, specialists and people who want to volunteer their, their services. And we've been piloting this with CC. We did a presentation to about over 100 members uh, virtually just before Christmas. And I'm really, really pleased to say we got 40 expressions of interest. People who want to use their specialist accountancy or, or uh, tax skills to work with us on fraudsters. Now, um, the, slightly frustratingly, 
um, we will, as we they become police volunteers, they will need to go through a degree of vetting and things like that. And the same people doing that are also working flat out as we're recruiting at pace with our uplift program. So there's been a little bit of delay, but we've the good news is we're processing the first eight or so of those uh, volunteers. And we're running another event with CC uh, later this month, I believe. So we are still keen to progress it. It has been a bit challenging during the pandemic. And if it works, which I'm confident it will, we will be looking to expand that to other sectors as well. I hope that sort of answers the question. Thank you very much, Ian. That's very helpful. I'm now going to move on to the questions around uh, taxis and also motorcycle parking. And I think uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce uh, McVean, uh, I'm going to bring you in here. You deal with strategic uh, transportation. Uh, would you like to come in on those questions, please? And then I'll move on to the Museum of London after that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Catherine. And just to introduce myself, I'm Bruce McVean, Acting Assistant Director for City Transportation at the Corporation. Um, so the question on taxis related to um, access on Bishopsgate uh, following the restrictions that have been introduced by Transport for London uh, on that street. Um, very happy, and I'll pop an email address into the chat um, to, to look into the specifics of that one and, and pass on any uh, concerns to TFL. Um, on a more general point, um, we've made some temporary changes to our streets uh, as well in response to COVID-19 and in particular to enable social distancing. Um, we've taken care with those to make sure that taxis can access um, all addresses uh, and that includes um, exempting taxis uh, carrying disabled passengers from streets where we've put in temporary uh, timed access restrictions as well. Um, so absolutely recognise the important role for taxis uh, in terms of disabled access and we'll always look to enable that uh, wherever we can but i um, happy to look into the specifics around that Bishopsgate issue and as I said raise that with uh, TfL for you but I'll put the email address in now uh, or in a second. Um, so it's a question on motorcycle parking. Um, Again, yes, uh, happy to look into um, the details of that particular location. We're always happy to um, review uh, parking and make sure it works for everybody as well. But again, if you could just reply or, or send details of your of your shop and your location to the email address that I'll put in the chat now, then I can follow up on that separately. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. And then uh, on the Museum of London, um, uh, Peter Lisley, would you like to come in, uh, please, uh, Peter? Yes. Uh... Okay, thank you, Catherine. Yes, um, just a quick update on the Museum of London. Uh, the Museum of London achieved planning permission last year, and now we're working closely with the museum project team uh, to work through uh, what works need to be done for the new museum in West Smithfield. Um, if you're in the city or the next time you're coming through the city, you should see our works already underway on uh, dealing with issues on the poultry market roof. And over the next few months, we'll be starting a package of work to address structural issues in the general market to the west of the site, uh, which has suffered over the years from water damage. Thank you, Kevin. Good, thank you very much. Um, and next, I think we've got some remaining questions about uh, 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 rate and rent relief. Uh, Phil, do you want to come in? There's a particular one. Oh, no, it's Peter, Peter Young. Excuse me, everybody. Uh, Peter Young, I think uh, we've had a question about uh, why some tenants are getting rent uh, relief and others uh, may not seem to be. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Catherine. Peter Young here from the uh, City Surveyors. Yes, yeah, so we've got over a thousand tenants, which we've been obviously working with quite closely over the last four quarters in terms of what support we can give them um, to carry them through this COVID period, which we appreciate has been very, very difficult. Uh, the specific question relates to our housing revenue account and those tenants at the Middlesex Street Estate, where members have considered what support they can give within their budget. And at the moment, that rental support has been in deferral of rents, but uh, we would encourage individual tenants to approach us as landlords so that we can understand their circumstances much better and see what support we can offer going forward because we appreciate we haven't come out of this pandemic yet. Thank you. Thanks very much. So the real message is please keep in touch with us. Please, uh, uh, yeah, please contact um, us. So um, 
I have a question around footfall, whether we're monitoring footfall back into the city. Um, Damien, would you like to come in on that one and when we're expecting a uh, return? Very good. Um, yes, uh, very happy to. And uh, Peter Lizzie may also want to come in uh, on this one uh, from the sort of goal group um, angle. But I think the, the, the sense here is very much that uh, we are following the guidelines from government and until there is any indication that there should or need to be um, uh, anything other than uh, working from home, then that, that will be the strong guidance. That said, we're obviously looking at when there is likely to be a uh, return. And our sense, and it's very sort of finger in the air, is you know, that before uh, Easter, that's very unlikely. And that when it does come, it's likely to be much more around workers, for instance, than visitors. We think that visitors, it's going to be a much slower return. And particularly international visitors, it's, it's many, many months away before that uh, can happen in any numbers. But um, Peter Lizzie may also want to, to come in on this one. Peter. Um, yes, I think I think as you'll appreciate, the uh, the news changes quite regularly on what's happening, and so we've just heard about uh, extra work being done on the South African variant. So we're trying to maintain flexibility about what we do in our response. Uh, clearly, we we're looking to support the city in any way we can. You'll notice we've had a test centre in Guildhall Yard. Um, we're rolling out asymptomatic testing for those workers who have to come into the city, and I'm sure testing will remain a feature of. Uh, returning safely to the workplace uh, in the short term. Um, we look at uh, further ahead and as Damien said uh, that will depend in part on the vaccine rollout, how effective the vaccine is on uh, preventing transmission. So ultimately we're trying to keep ahead and think ahead of uh, what's happening, looking at the news coming out uh, and working ways we can support the city to uh, return as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, but I think one of the features that we're coming to understand is that it will not be a big bang and that suddenly overnight everything will be different. It's going to be a uh, graduated process of restrictions gradually being lifted. Uh, people will still be nervous, I think, because we've been in this situation for a, for, for a year. And so we have to understand that we're also dealing with a, a whole load of individuals who have different appetites to risk. Uh, and we'll have to work through that as part of our plans. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Now, before I look for more questions, I'm just going to check that none of my colleagues uh, want to add anything. Jeremy, did you want to come in at all? No, I'm fine at the moment. Thank you very much. And uh, Town Clerk, was there anything you wanted to add? I assume not in that case. I have a quest I have a few more questions about the Museum of London and uh, what happens if they don't raise uh, their fundraising. I have to say that at this moment we are pressing on with the museum. We are expecting it to happen. There are of course uh, challenges uh, uh, to meet, but uh, we are expecting it to happen. Very happy to discuss further if you want to uh, contact me. Do I have any other questions, uh, Claire, or anyone to prompt me with? I wonder then if, um, Caroline, perhaps you could just reiterate so everybody has it very firmly in mind, the time frame now on the on the rates question. And then I'm going to come back to another transport question. Caroline? Sure, thank you very much, Catherine. So time frames Finance Committee will be looking at the proposals for the business rate premium, and they will look at that in their meeting in February, and then it will be confirmed, um, and they'll make recommendations to the Court of Common Council who will consider it on the 4th of March. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Bruce, you wanted to come in on some more transport questions. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And some uh, great questions coming in. Uh, so a question about bus charging and electric uh, buses. Um, so uh, as you may know, Transport for London managed the bus network um, uh, across London, but we uh, are very keen to encourage them to accelerate the transition towards electric buses. And uh, I know that they're also very keen to accelerate that transition. And it was welcoming to see in their uh, financial sustainability plan, which they submitted to government recently, that one of the things they've asked for funding on 
uh, is electric buses so they can speed up uh, the rollout uh, of those uh, buses. Also recognising that what London does also delivers uh, benefits for elsewhere because it starts to build a market uh, for that new technology as well. So that's very encouraging. A um, couple of questions uh, around um, uh, vehicle access. So the first asking whether we uh, intend to uh, enable more uh, access for private transport um, in response to COVID-19. So the measures we've put in place uh, so far have generally, where they've been in place, restricted uh, vehicle access or limited that in some way. And that's so that we can reallocate street space to walking and cycling. Um, we're keeping those plans under review, but I should say as a general rule, we're not looking to encourage uh, driving uh, into the city, not least we don't have enough car parking spaces to allow a meaningful number of people to drive in, but also uh, I think it's crucial that we uh, in particular uh, encourage and enable people to walk, which is still the main way that people are travelling around uh, on our streets. Um, and then uh, more generally beyond COVID-19, I guess as we move into recovery, a question about what we're looking to do to reduce uh, vehicle volumes to help move us towards net zero in terms of carbon emissions. Um, so our transport strategy was adopted um, in May 2019 and that sets out our plans, uh, which includes um, championing and supporting a, a smarter approach to road user charging, so the next generation of congestion charge um, to help reduce traffic, but also some quite specific actions for ourselves, including uh, reducing the number of freight vehicles uh, through um, freight consolidation and uh, last mile delivery hubs, so more, more deliveries on uh, cargo bikes uh, and on foot uh, as well. Thank you very much. And in that context, Bruce, we're also speaking with others about how the river might be used more, um, a, a, an underused resource for London, how we can go back to where it was a few centuries ago, carrying a lot of London's uh, 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 traffic. But that's at an early, an early stage. Um, uh, the work on reducing traffic also ties in with our, our, our ambitious plans, uh, our, our ambitious climate action strategy that you've heard a bit about. And I'm just going to ask Damien if he wants to add anything on that. Damien. Thanks very much. Yes, the, the climate action strategy, uh, which was passed by members uh, last October, is, is a really um, robust and ambitious piece of work where we've looked to ensure that we've included all of the emissions that we're able to um, measure and that we are being realistic and ambitious in the way that we're addressing them. Um, this, this means that on what is called scope one and two for the corporation, that is sort of the, the directly produced emissions, we're looking to 2027 uh, to be net zero. And then for the full um, value chain of emissions, it will be 2040. We also have ambitions for the square mile, and that of course will mean working very closely with uh, transport providers, uh, tenants and landlords right across the square mile, also with developers. So this is going to influence the way that we um, adopt new planning regulations, the way that we work in terms of transport. Um, but we want this to be something that is very focused both around business success and around jobs. So we're, we're clear that the measures that we're going to be putting in place, particularly around retrofitting, will create about 800 jobs over the next few years. And in terms of working across the, the square mile with businesses, we're wanting to see how we can support particularly smaller businesses to come up with a net zero plan, which will both save them money and will ensure that they're able to bid for contracts from big firms which are increasingly going to be looking very carefully at their own supply chains to make sure it's net zero. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Damien. Very helpful. Um, I think in terms of specific questions about people who haven't received grants that they would find uh, ha helpful or um, who want to know their particular position, I think it's probably easiest if you write in and could I ask someone to post a uh, address in the inbox if it's not already there in the chat box. Do we have any other questions from anybody? Team, have I missed anything that I should have spotted, please? So it doesn't look as if I have. We will be picking up all the questions and uh, uh, covering them in our follow-up. 
Um, I just want to check again, Jeremy, if you have any final comments to make. I don't think so. In that case, I would just like to thank you all for spending the time to come and uh, join this session today. I do realise this is a very challenging time uh, for uh, uh, many of you and indeed for us. Um, I, you know, we will do what we can to help. Unfortunately, it can't be everything, but we will do what we can. Uh, and please uh, uh, do keep in touch and uh, best wishes and keep safe. Um, Sorry, Jeremy. I my mute button. I would simply say thank you and really urge people to lobby our IMP. Yeah, indeed. Good. Thank you very much. Let's hope we are, I'm sure we will be in a happier um, uh, position next time we talk to you and we look forward to doing that again. Thank you all very much. Thank you.